life you're gonna... <laughs> At least we don't think it's life changing. I'm sure mm -hmm. some people did. I've heard people say that Credence was also life changing, so, you know. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of the Literary Liberation Podcast. Today we'll be discussing Inns and Reviewing the Familiar by Lee Bardugo. Don't forget there is a link below to sign up for our free newsletter for more information and updates about us and the podcast. For more content outside of the podcast, please check out our Instagram and TikTok at Literary Liberation and Twitter at Lit Lib Podcast. I'm your co-host Kristen. You can find me at KRXXCXN on all social media platforms. And I'm your co-host Mariah, and you can find me at Hungry Rye on all social media platforms. We're going to get into it, and we're going to preface this by saying this is actually a re-recording because we had technical difficulties, so yes. I think this is going to be a little bit more polished. Yeah, because um, we already discussed this all we're going to do our best to, <laughs> to get the vibes and really, like, hone in on our review of The Familiar. Um, if you are looking for information about Lee Bardugo as an author, go check out Shadow and Bone trilogy episode that we did, because we spent a lot of time talking about Lee Bardugo and that and controversy surrounding her. And the only new controversy that she has had since that episode has been recently that we saw on TikTok with the Familiar's book release. She had a panel and somebody asked her a question in regards to her writing um, people of color, like POC characters. Um, and like profiting off them and somebody raised the question of like is it like ethical for you to do this and then um they also really also stay very silent about politics online on instagram and then about specifically like palestine and the genocide of palestine yeah. um i'll insert the video here so if anybody hasn't seen it or anything like that so you can watch it for the full context i'll also link it in the description those very same characters or very same books don't use their platforms to advocate for actual real life people. I mean, I'm sensing from your question that you feel disappointed in me in some way. Specifically about what's happening in Palestine. And it just, it's a big disappointment, especially coming from someone who's read your books for a very long time. I understand, and I can hear the pain in your voice. And I guess I would say this. A few years ago, I stopped being political on Instagram, okay? I stopped, and I stopped because I, first of all, I realized I had posted um, some infographics that were completely wrong. Like, I had done more harm than I did good. And I also realized that I had, I was spending more time performing being a good person than actually taking any kind of action. I hope you know how much I don't think anyone can see the bloodshed and heartbreak and loss in Gaza and not feel sadness and shame and grief. And that is something I experience every day. And that's all I can offer. And I understand if that's not enough. Uh, I like overwhelmingly, like Kristen and I feel as though it is very important that collectively we continue to call out big content creators and that includes authors because we're consuming their content especially when they are writing um like politically charged books that have revolutionary themes this isn't necessarily per uh, pertain to just lee bardugo um but this should go out to all mainstream authors especially when there is an active genocide happening um but i also think it's very frustrating to see a hyperfixation on one individual who has shown that she does support um the, like Liberation. Palestine even though it was a very it surface wasn't... level yeah. like you know it could be better she can do a lot more I don't think it's performative for her to be saying like any extra or sharing infographics like that I know that was one of her things that she had said that she was worried about sharing misinformation and she she can still do the research she should be doing yes. the research especially if she's gonna write like political books about oppression i think that is very important as an author to do that so that's kind of where we're at with that yeah and like my main criticism of her take where she was just like i decided to not be political on like social media anymore where people that are in like different communities and stuff like that like the lgbt or people of color just don't have that option to stop being political like white people or white women have that opportunity to just claim to not be political anymore because of different situations because a lot of the times like people of color or lgbt 
rights and stuff like that are made into political issues whenever they shouldn't be but i think it's a very privileged take to say that you have that privilege to say that you don't have to be political online and i think that it's maybe not necessarily harmful but i do feel like it is own death to say and to have that opinion and instead of herself just like saying that she's not political because she felt like it was performative i think that it's not harmful but i think that she instead of stopping like all politics on social media and like feeling like it's performing you can actually go out and do those acts of activism if you really wanted to make a difference instead of just sitting there yeah that's where we're sitting without mm -hmm. it and so i just thought it was important to acknowledge that considering it is happening right now it's been in the last week and this will be going up very shortly after we record it so yes hopefully it's fresh in everyone's minds but we will get into the familiar so Kristen wrote this summary and i think it is very good it is not just a rip off of goodreads which is usually what i do or i pull it from like the author's like website so i'll let Kristen get into the summary uh so louisa is a poor servant who uses simple acts of magic to make it throughout the day uh until her wicked mistress discovers her little miracles and she demands that louisa uses her magic to entertain and perform to increase her own social standing as Louisa becomes more well known for these little miracles and the spectacle she has become, a rich man reaches out to her and offers to become a patron as she has now entered into a magical competition gifted to the king to help win the war. Louisa is tired of living the life of the poor orphan scullion, so she seizes this opportunity for a better life. With Jewish and Muslim people being persecuted left and right in Christian Spain, she must hide her true identity with the help of Santa Angel and um, an immortal familiar who's looking for a way out of his own curse um so far this book um as of the time of us doing research for it i um, can has garnered around I, 4.2 what i can check did you want to update it update it because i'm sure more people have read it we have um right now it is at 4.2 stars out of 3361 reading so a little bit less than so what. it's going down which is interesting not by much um, but considering it's almost a thousand more rating over a thousand more ratings it's only gone down 0.5 stars i feel like i mean me and you both rated it four stars to you on goodreads so i feel like that i bet uh storygraph probably has a more accurate rating because you can do quarter stars and stuff like that so, so it's at 4.28 on storygraph which i don't out of 695 reviews on Storygraph. So it's a little bit higher on Storygraph with less people reviewing, but I feel like it may be more accurate because people are able to go in specifically and do like their point specific because there's quarter star. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Which uh both me and Mariah I think ended up rating it four point two five stars. Yeah. We can get into our spoiler free review and then also kind of incorporate some of what other people had been saying and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna go with um, your Well I think, I, well, since I gave it 4.25, I think I liked it more than I disliked it, but there's definitely some things, like, with the criticism where people were complaining that this it was slow, it, the pacing was bad, and that it was uninteresting. I don't think it was uninteresting, but I kind of like historical fiction usually, so I think that can be something where I can easily see that people that aren't interested in any type of historical fiction could see it as being boring, stuff like that, because it does kind of incorporate history within it but i don't think it's as historical like historically accurate as like babel is or like you don't learn as much from it like you do from babel but i felt like reading babel i learned a lot about like the opium wars but reading the familiar i feel like i did not uh, a lot about like um spain's like economic system or like the spanish position and stuff like that which i feel like could have been relevant to like the historicalness of this book I agree. I don't feel like I had a lot of takeaways when it came from, like, any sort of, like, socioeconomics or, um, like, patriarchy. Like, it just seemed very... It was hard to tell surface whether it was something almost. that was surface level or if it was just, like, a, a self kind of, like, insert for the author to, like, be able to talk about, like, oppression. Like, I'm sure it did exist to that extent. I just wish there would have been a little bit more. And I think that's contributed to me also giving it a 4.25 star, is you're left wanting a lot more with this book, because even though, I don't know, like, the it's, like, a romantic historical yeah. fiction, which I, I was not going into it, and I do feel like it starts off really strong, where it gives kind of the Babel vibes with the magic system and whatnot, and then it kind of devolves into just 
Rom- straight up romanticy yeah. and you kind of lose track of the plot because it just focuses focuses on the characters and character development and that's fine but that's just not something i was looking forward to in this book in particular mm-hmm. i feel like it's something very different for Lee Bardugo too like if you read like the other books they're a lot more politically charged like all of the grisha verse is more politically charged even though it's not like a very deep marxist ideology i do think it is significantly more than what the familiar is in any way i would have to agree and like i know the whole grisha verse obviously there's a lot more to it mm-hmm. there's more pages more the time books. to develop <laughs> different characters and like the world building however it's been done before like it's you, or authors are capable of creating like nuanced and interesting worlds and it's kind of frustrating in a sense the way that Lee Bardugo kind of uses like a religion and nobility like it's the same tropes that were present in the Grisha verse mm-hmm. kind of reuse the main male character is also like gives darkling vibes which a lot of other people agreed with Kristen doesn't see it nearly as much, but kind of like the vibes of him. Even though he doesn't really look like him, he's just like a broody, like, I don't think he looks like him, but I think, I think that's also just, like, typical, like, especially romanticy in, like, what is popular on book talk is, like, your morally gray, dark, evil man that's not necessarily evil, but, like, has been put in that situation where he has to make bad choices. So I don't think it's necessarily a criticism of, like, this is all Lee Bardugo's, like, main men. I just think that's, like what's popular now so that's kind of what i think it's like a sign of the times i don't think it's fair to criticize lee bardugo because i mean you look at all of these other books that are popular right now and they're all say more i think with that it's because she decided to kind of like pick a comfortable trope it doesn't really stand out yeah like it's it's not not gonna be something that life changing (laughs) at least we don't think it's life changing i'm sure Mm -hmm. some people did i've heard people say that credence was also life changing so you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i don't know he didn't Anything change my happen. life for the worse i guess <laughs> um he gave me a new standard of book rating that's for sure yeah i definitely know what a bad book is now i don't think i've ever read a book so bad but i mean people also do like people are comparing it to like phantom of the opera in ways and they say that it's classically bardugo and i can see the classically bardugo if you're just looking at like the romance between Nikolai and Zoya or even like Paz and Inej like the vibes are sort of there where it's just like it is a beautiful romance story but I think for at least I know like me and Mariah personally we didn't pick up like Six of Crows or like the King of Scars duology because we were interested in those romances the political sector of it but that's also just something that like me and Mariah prefer usually I think in our fantasies yeah it's not really really hard time with fan like if it's gonna be a high fantasy it has to just be strictly high fantasy i don't ever really see like romance being incorporated it and having it such a center focused and not just like a back burner moment Mm -hmm. um it just doesn't land right with me it is hard i feel like i like it whenever it's more like longing and i feel like one thing with this is that like I don't want to spoil it, but you could tell that the who the romance is going to be very early on, and I don't feel like like the slow burnness that I prefer in my books. I mean, this book is it's longer; it's four hundred pages, but it's not super long. Where you're sitting there like, will they, won't they? Very much. I feel like like there is no, a bit but of even that. I felt their relationship was rushed. Yeah. Okay. So. And that says a lot because I'm. Brian I wants some down behavior. <laughs> Brian wants some comment on page one. I don't know. It just didn't feel like that natural progression. I don't know. Either just like jump his bones or like don't hold hands until page 800. I, Yeah. Which I'm a person don't touch each other till it's been a million days. But um, okay. So other than that, I don't know if there's anything else specifically like non-spoilery that we want to get into. I would say if you're interested, if you like historical fiction i do think you would like this if you like any of the lee bardugo's writing it's beautifully written like it's it's lovely. very charming yeah like there's plenty of quotes that are i'm like ooh la la like i'm like twirling my hair and i'm like oh this is cute you know and like it, there'll be some scenes where i'm like oh it makes me sad because it's like a sad story and things like that but i don't like if you're looking for something that's like super high like politically charged and things like that you're not going to get this it's just a romance and if you and i think a lot of people like romances so if you like a romance i do think this is a beautifully written romance and i do think 
It's charming. I would say read it. That's it. That's all I have to yeah. say until the spoiler zone. Um, um, but I guess we'll go specifically in the s- into the story now. So I feel like it's not necessarily like spoilery in this first part, but it is going specifically into specific plot points. So if you don't want anything, if you want to go into this book and what we said, I would say more than likely read it, especially if you like typical book talk books i think it fits right in to the book talk like narrative and stuff like that because i think at least like the section of book talk i'm in i think it is very much like a romance based not that i even necessarily like romance but i do think anybody that like reads that stuff would like this so i would say just go ahead and read it if that's something you're into especially if you like lee bardugo which i'm sure most people are probably already reading it but anyways, moving on. Spoiler zone. Now we shall segue to the 1500 Spanish Inquisition, where we follow our main character. So, w- me and Mariah have not done that much research into 1500 Spain, which is whenever this takes place. I think it's like later 1500s, like maybe like mid 1500s, closer to like 1600s ish. It there's no direct dates. But um, there are characters that do exist, uh, in real that did exist in real life, in real history, and things like that that are mentioned throughout this, which is uh, Antonio which is Perez. Something I didn't know until Kristen brought this up. I had yeah. no idea that this was. So Antonio Perez is um, I don't know. He's like some type of like secretary or something from the king. And also in the book and in this, he ends up killing some type of other, like, guys, like, person or something. I don't know the exact lore about it. Sorry, and I'm not a Spanish history buff. But he kills someone, so then he falls out of grace within uh, the king's, like, good favor. So this is kind of, like, why the story basically happens. But like, it's like a I, historical retelling of this, but if you were to, like, sprinkle magic and romance into it. Yes. But, like, I don't know. I was trying to do some... Re- I was doing very surface-level research, too. So anybody that would love to, like, educate us on this, we would totally take it because we don't know that much. Like, the basic I know is, like, from, like, sophomore year world history, Spanish, like, history in that way. Like, I know Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 because of uh Queen Isabel and whoever her husband is, some dude, I don't know. And so this is, like, basically right after... Uh, Spain kind of gets into, like, this, like, kind of like a golden age, I guess, but they quickly fall out of this golden age because of their funding of the Spanish Inquisition, and so if anybody doesn't know, and this book will not teach you really that much about it, the Spanish Inquisition is kind of like cops, I guess, but, like, I wouldn't... They're like the crusaders, like yeah. religious crusaders. Like, they're trying to catch heretics. any heretics within, like, Spain or anybody that doesn't follow the Catholic, specifically, religion. Like, they don't like Protestants, they don't like Muslims, they don't like Jews. They catch anybody that's not Catholic, basically, and sentence them to death or whatever it is. And um, this can cause a lot of issues because, actually, um, Louisa herself is Jewish, but she's converted so basically during this time, like all people that were raised Jewish, Muslim or whatever, they would have to convert to live in Spain or they either had to leave Spain or they would get captured and killed is what the Inquisition did to them. So this is something that like is constantly like in Louisa's back of her mind, even though she does go to like Catholic church every week. She doesn't actually I don't she's Jewish and she's not actually Catholic and she goes through a lot of like inner turmoil within herself throughout the book about act practicing these catholic practices and things like that like going to mass and things like that because these are not something that like her family ever raised her and a lot of her magic actually has to do with like her speaking in like latin and hebrew which it's like spells kind of but she also like based on the language too it's very it's i don't think the magic system is very in depth it's not in depth and it also doesn't feel super developed because it's not consistent throughout the story (laughs) It's, it's not consistent throughout the story with the other characters, but, like, because there's other main characters, these holy children that we, like, sir, we, we find out that they're trying to, like, get we'll go somebody to, death to help the that. king. But, but their powers are different, so there really is no logic or meaning to the magic system, and I don't think anyone going into it would 
it doesn't do you any good to be like fixated on it because it doesn't benefit you in the long run like it's kind of like a like a red herring in a sense like to keep readers along i don't I, it's yeah. just it um, kind of just is you kind of just go with the vibes throughout the whole thing and hope for the best it is kind of a vibey book and that's one thing that i feel like it's so different from like the grishaverse because like the grishaverse has this very strict set of rules on how the magic is and stuff like that with like studying the small science i didn't need to bump my microphone but st- studying the small science and there's like only specific things and it's a lot more scientific based and- which i really enjoyed with the grishaverse but then this it kind of just felt like not fully developed because everyone does kind of have like their own magic in different ways that every like character that is magical is completely different but something that i thought could be important to talk about is that like since louisa is like a scullion she's like a maid and then discussing like valentina who is her mistress who uh exploits her specifically like she was already exploiting her as like her maid and stuff like that yeah to do like the housework and the chores and things like that but then it becomes even a step further whenever she discovers that louisa is magical whenever she realizes that hey i can use this as like a form of entertainment as well as like make louisa into a performer because she knows if she can utilize yeah if we can clout climb in that way and having people come over to your dinner parties and you go over to their dinner parties and then it'll earn her more prestige and that's Mm -hmm. kind of all women of the economic ruling class could hope for because they didn't have any sort of like social mobility outside of their husband so Mm -hmm. and then like uh with hashtag work it valentina and marius they are kind of already in like a struggling situation because um they're, they own, like, a field or something, and they're in a loveless marriage, but their, like, field and, like, crops, like, they don't make as much money as they do to, as they used to, or basically is what Valentina was basically told by, like, her family, and I feel, it's hard to feel bad for Valentina at the beginning of the book, and I do think she has a really wonderful growth throughout the book, but I think in the very beginning, it's very hard to like her because she is very selfish, but I feel like this shows me that the reason why, like, people are so selfish, especially in, like, capitalistic economies, is because it's specifically, like... The disenfranchisement. No, it's, like... From society. It's, like, like the, She was taking the, out her frustrations with patriarchy on her scullery maid. Well, there's that, but then it's also, like, she was raised that way. Like, her mother and father would have raised her and be like, oh, like, this is how you raise your social standing, is you marry a nice husband, a rich husband, and that is how you do better and things like that where you host these lavish dinner parties and things like that and you're taught to basically exploit your workers and things like that and your laborers within your house but whenever you don't actually realize that like the higher-ups are also oppressing her as well and keeping her within the same social standards that makes sense i think so i think i'm following what you're saying but then because like even they like valentina and marius they are on like a completely step of the ladder than like Victor, whatever his name is, Parodides, Par- Parodies, Par- I don't know how to say his last name, Victor. Parodies? Uh, I don't know. But, like, he's know. kind of like, I guess, he, I would say he's kind of like the villain, or like the antagonist of the story, because he um, sees that he can basically exploit, like, Valentina and Marius, and then also louisa too to make himself because he's a very rich man but he doesn't have a title and he wants a title like duke or prince or whatever i don't know that much i don't know that much about like medieval titles and things like that but he realizes that he's already rich he basically just needs something that put like writes his name in stone basically to get that opportunity and he easily sees that with louisa and Marius and Val- Valentina able to exploit, like, that family to raise his own social standings. Which, I don't understand why he doesn't just enter, like, son on son on hell into, like, that competition. He could win, don't you think? I don't know. I don't know if he wanted to win or if he just wanted to utilize him. But he also, he could never, like, divorce himself truly from him and, like, maintain. It's very confusing, like, why he didn't. Mm-hmm. Maybe he was just... Uh, greedy i think that's kind of like what his over he kind of was like i feel like your stereotypical like twirling mustache villain where it's like he didn't have much motivation other than being rich and powerful which he already was rich and powerful but he wanted to be more 
rich and powerful, basically. Which I think can be a fine motivation if you make your character more complex. Because at least, like, I understand, like, in real life that, like, the billionaires and stuff like that are kind of just, like, evil twirling mustaches villains. But whenever you- you don't want to read about that. You want to read about more interesting and complex characters, which I think is why, like, the Darkling is a very interesting villain to have for um like the Greechaverse because he is he is trying to do the right thing but he's not going about it in the same way versus like this guy like he's is like not a truly trying... morally gray character yeah because like what you know? the Darkling wanted was fair for like the Grisha but it's just to put himself higher up he couldn't give a, a less of a fuck about his family or friends or anything like that you know and Which I can think you start to see, like, with the preparation for the first trial and, like, how he treats Louisa and mm -hmm. especially, like, his kind of threats that he throws her way. Like, you need to do Like, these you need things. to listen to me directly because, like, do there's... Do not make me embarrassed. Yeah. Like, you're going to do this and you're going to win. So and he's... she's got a lot on the line. Yeah. And then also you can kind of see it, too, with how, uh, I don't know how to say her name, but Louisa's aunt, who late, who lit something like that the widow um yeah because she is victor's mistress and she's able to pass herself off uh because widows are have more power within like this type of society where they don't have because they were previously married it basically shows that like they i don't know exactly how to word it because they don't have like a, like they're still like a patron but since their like main patriarchal influence died they have a little bit more freedom and will to... It's kind of because her original, like, virtue was still intact, but it was, like, stripped away from her, on, like, not because of her decisions. Like, that's yeah. always the vibe I've gotten from, like, that was, like, they're still viewed with respect and honor in society because mm -hmm. they follow the rules. So then, but then, who lit? I don't know. Uh, she kind of is able to have more freedom within society and stuff like that, which I think is what makes her, like, the perfect target for Victor as well to easily like exploit her, but then also give her the money where she's able to live like a style, even though she is also hiding pretty much in ways like Louisa is because they are related and they lie about being related throughout the whole novel. But I think it's not just that, it's like her ability to like use sex work mm -hmm. as a means of ensuring like, her economic <laughs> stability in the same way that Valentina has also done this but she has done it from like a marriage standpoint mm -hmm. they're like two Sankara. sides of this the Sankara quote yeah. always comes back you can say it where he says I wish I could pull it up it's on my shelf somewhere but it's in Women's Liberation, the African Freedom Struggle, but he talks about the only difference between um, the housewife and the prostitute is the length of the contract and the wage, which I think is exemplified in this book between these two characters. You get to see that yeah. dynamic pull through. They're still victims of patriarchy, but they are handling it in two different ways. Yeah, and I, I would argue that one almost is in a better standing too um not that i think that like having especially like prostituting yourself out is like a fair labor practice in any way but i do think that it definitely shows that like compared to who like late was like sleeping with and prostituting with was victor who is a higher class than uh marius was to valentina that it makes a big difference even though they might have been even though, like, Kulait was from, like, a lower economic class. Um, but now I guess we can go directly into, like, trial one. Oh, so, as I mentioned earlier, Antonio Perez, a real man in real life, don't know much about him, he's dead, who cares? Um, he's holding this trial basically because I don't think he did anything like this in real life. I don't know if he ever tried to do anything to get back into the king's good graces. Because he basically got fired of being, like, secretary to the king or something. For, I don't know if he actually killed this person or, like, hired a hit on this other person or whatever, but it was basically, like, politically problematic. So he's fallen out of the king's good graces, and he wants to hold this trial to basically say to the king, like, hey, I can get you this person that's practicing holy magic. So it has to be specifically, like, 
Catholic magic, Christian magic, to basically give the king power to fight against England, because I believe they're still, like, it's, like, after, like, War of the Roses or whatever, so, like, Spain and England are very, like, uh, like, they're not allied nations in any way, because also I think, I want to say England was I Protestant. I want a world map. They're pretty close-ish. Like, especially with them both. No, like a 1500s. Oh, of, like, Spain uh, versus the UK. But I know that, like, they're both trying to colonize, like, America at this time. And they already have, like, issues within that. But then also, I believe, I want to say England was Protestant during that time and stuff like that. With Spain being a very Catholic nation, that's obviously heretic. And I would argue that England probably had more power than Spain probably did at that time. So I think it's Spain probably felt weaker and they didn't want to feel as weak, you know? So I think this is something that's like, hey, I can give you this holy person, this holy magician, basically, that can help you win against England, is what Perez's idea is. But you learn very quickly that I I don't know what kind of trials I was expecting or what you were expecting, but it certainly wasn't what it was uh, presented because the trials are a little silly. Yeah. Little silly, goofy things. And I think we figured out when we originally recorded this that we thought it was pretty intentional to show how the logic behind proving like a holy magic user is, is it stupid. doesn't make sense. It's yeah. not logical. So like, the first trial they have to just show off their talent the second trial they're what what how do they label them you have to like introduce your there was three ways of the the trials they they make them sound really fancy and then they're just not yeah but like the first one basically which is what like after louisa gets picked up by victor that's basically like hey you're gonna train with uh santa on hill and you're gonna Learn how to use your magic for real after she kills a man. Um, because she like grows like a giant tree and she her main power is like within language and she can kind of like expand and like grow things from very little. Um But in this one trial that she goes to the first trial they just have to like show that they have magical skills basically. And so everyone was kind of hoping that, like, maybe somebody was fake and that they're just doing illusions and things like that. And then this is where we meet the other people that are also, like, participating in this trial. And you have Kyoda. I don't know how to say her last Halcyon. name. Halcyon. Halcyon. Halcon? I don't know. Maybe. What, uh, Teoda? We got Teoda, which is, like, a young girl. Yeah who has this ability to see in the future where she says, like, an angel whispers into her dreams or whatever, which is how she's able to see the future and things like that. And then we have Fortune, Fortune Donade, who is, he has, like, musical powers. They call him the Prince of Olives, where he's in a, uh, he um clicks with Louisa very much because he has a very similar, where he has a rich patron that he has to sleep with for political power. Not that Louisa has to sleep with Victor for political power, but he does immediately assume that. But he is of a lower class where he is trying to work for the king to basically have that sort of stepping stone into a new class where he's not working on a farm his entire life is his thing. And then you have Gracia. And then you have Gracia de la Barrera, I think. And de Gracia, Gracia de Valera. We'll go with that. But Gracia is not very relevant. She is... She... I, she's just described as being, like, very beautiful. That's kind of, like, it. But, I mean, they do their trials. She's pretty. <laughs> yeah. And she's literally... But she's a fake. You learn very quickly. She's fake. Yeah. But, I mean, when you come in in these first trials, she de- ends up doing the same thing that, like, Louisa was planning on doing. But this is when Louisa does hers, and she, like... Manipul- she like destroys a bunch of glass and then manipulates it to make into this constellation over Antonio Perez that's supposed to be like the constellation under which he killed that person under or something so it's kind of like oh she also has kind of like a vision of sight sort of thing too but then you later learn that she actually read Santa Angel's 
uh, correspondence to other people where he's, like, gossiping, I don't want to say, but, like, that, and you basically it's learn... tweeting? Yeah. But you basically learn that, like, that's where you learn that, like, Louisa is kind of cutthroat and that she isn't as dumb as, like, what you may seem or what she has been presenting to, um, the other people where she kind of has to keep up this, like, facade of being, like, a scullion, like, a ditzy, poor scullion maid just to get further into this competition so people don't think that she's lying or a heretic or anything like that. So it's very much of, a, like, not being your true self. And I think that's something that... I think this focuses on a lot with Louisa. Being true to herself. Yeah. Which... It was strategic, for sure. Like, she definitely... Mm -hmm. Like, down to, like, her costumery, her mannerisms. Like, it all benefited her in the long run to get her where she needs to go. Like, it was all survival base. Yeah. Um... So that's basically the first trial, and then after that, we go into trial two, where Louisa and Santangel are basically very much starting their phys physical and romantic relationship at this point, because Santangel originally kind of viewed her as, like, dumb scullion maid, but then he realizes that, oh, she's actually intelligent. So women are actually hot when they're smart, kind of thing. Um, it does kind of give <laughs> that vibe. Um, and then Luisa clocks him on it, at least. Yeah. She definitely calls out, like, oh, you just assumed that I was stupid. And he's like, well, you did portray it that way. And she's like, well, I didn't really have a choice. And that's one thing that, like, I think it kind of shows where at least, like, Santa Angel was, because uh, you kind of learn more about his curse and stuff, I think, at this point. And he was always kind of in, like, a privilege uh, place because, like, he was... I don't know what exactly he was, but, like, he was able to travel and do things with his best friend and explore his best friend's body in ways. It doesn't really make sense because it was 1000 AD. He's yeah. Right? He's been doing it for, like, 500 years. Wow, shocker. 500 fucking years old. I wish I could have seen that one coming. Yeah. Anyways, um, I don't know what Spain was like in the year 1000, so I literally don't know what the economics were like. No, but, I mean, we know that he was in, like, a privileged spot because he talks about basically wanting to be able to travel and learn and stuff like that and he was able to do that with his best friend where he was trying to he was trying to go around and find immortality too like he's always been scared to die um so he is going around and trying to figure that out and then he does and the curse that ends up being bestowed upon him is him and his best friend must he uh son on hell must give up the thing that he's valued least or something and then his best friend who i'm sorry can't remember that guy's name r.i.p he has to lose whatever he values most and what he ended up valuing most is like his love for saint angel and uh saint angel lost his luck because apparently he was a very lucky man which i'm sure being a rich white man anywhere was probably lucky anywhere you know <laughs> shocker <laughs> are we surprised um, so then, basically, what well, also with this curse is that San Angel is never able to be out of, like, so many miles away from the guy. Sorry, rip to that man. I really don't remember your name. But, it um, sounds like a V. Like yeah, it was something. something. I thought it was a T, to be honest. I think it could have been a T. Whatever. But Oops. um, he's dead. Um, But he can't basically be away from him or from, like his descendants as he starts having descendants and stuff like that because then he'll just burst into ash or something so he'll die and Give he's me scared some of midnight dying mass type vibe like yeah. vampires where they just turn into ash like that's quite literally how it is described mm -hmm. so he's kind of stuck and that's why he looks like a corpse in the beginning is because he's like giving up on life until his magic recognizes Louisa. Very romantic. And that's kind of where it, like, they get to like find that mutual understanding and longing for each other. I guess, yeah. even though they haven't known each other very long. I mean, to be honest, I'm imagining him as kind of a baddie, so I'd, I'd be in the same boat as Louisa. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, can't be that much of a baddie if Lee Bardugo gives us four fade to black scenes. Why four? Oh, give yeah. me one. Just give me one. That's all I want. I get one at one, and the rest could be faded black. Just, just one. 
I just wonder if maybe Lee Bardugo isn't comfortable with writing like smut scenes or feels. I think she could write a very well written smut scene because everything she writes is very well written. But I just I don't know why it's giving very like puritanical like Catholic vibes. Not wanting to write out the smut scenes, but. Anyways, that's just my gripe. It was lacking in the <laughs> smut. But basically, there's a second trial that happens. And honestly, I didn't even fully understand the second trial where it's just like a puppet show or something. And these people have to like, they have to do like magic reacting to the puppet show basically on what they would do to prove. This is them proving that their magic is holy, that it's from God that's giving them their magical powers. And they all do different things. Which, who knows what. But basically, it all goes wrong. Somebody starts doing something with the puppets and making terror. And making these them- shadow demons come out and start attacking people and things like that. And then Louisa has the power to make it all dark. And she does. And she saves everybody. And she specifically saves uh, Gracia. Specifically, because like she was so scared. And she basically tells Louisa, like, I'm not even here to win. I'm just here to try to find a husband. Sort of thing. Oh, she's like, what the fuck you doing here? Like, that's yeah. just the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, she leaves. Yeah, so she leaves because she's scared. And then they're trying to figure out who uh, did, who ruined this beautiful thing they had. Because obviously they're working with the devil. They're working with Satan. And you learn, you learn that it was Teoda actually is a heretic. And that, I don't know what exactly they give for like their reasoning of her being or how they knew it yeah well you find out that um donna day yes i know it was like donna day like her. turned it in or whatever like exposed her or whatever but i don't remember like what they were saying specifically was like what she was doing that made it no i don't think they proved that they just knew that she was saying things that were unsavory about the king and about like yeah uh, catholicism yes which i mean can't blame her but then that's basically, like, that second part is done. And then they kind of go into trial three almost immediately because they just lost two other uh, performers. So they basically are just like, well, we only have two left. And Donna Day is like, hey, Louisa, let's be besties and we can both do our magic together. And then the king will have to take us both. And Louisa, being the nice girl that she is, she's like, you know what? I don't really care that much. Like... Either way, like, my life's fucked either way, so I'll just do it. And then they do, like, the magic or whatever, and then Donna Day betrays her and starts doing his own little magical show. Which, again, I don't really know what the intention of this trial was meant to prove. I, it's just a showcase for the king, except the king doesn't actually show yeah, up. It was it's a person a that replaced Perez. Yeah, like some priest. So, so it... It wasn't anything like a relevancy. But then you basically just learned that Donde was evil. And then Perez was actually the reason why he was actually holding this whole like spectacle to try to get on the King's Good Graces was not actually to get to the King's Good Graces. It's to cause enough like drama and like all eyes on one thing so he can flee. And I think he does successfully flee. I don't know where to, but he gets away, basically. I don't know either. It... And it's not... Did it get built upon anymore? Do you remember? Not really. I just know that he's not, like, there. I don't think they talk about him again, to be honest. But then, basically, Louisa and Santantel realize that they were played for fools. So, Santantel's like, I gotta get Louisa out of here because, like, even if, like, they can prove that her magic is holy or whatever, they're still gonna put her in toledo ohio i don't know what's going on there every time they said toledo i was thinking of ohio for real i was like you know what that place does suck (laughs) oh (laughs) i forget that it's a real city in the united states not just like a location lee Berdugo chose for yeah a prison yeah but basically she like santan hill doesn't want her to get like caught because like basically if she does she'll she can easily like get tried as like a heretic and stuff like that because we know and Sant Anhel knows that she's not actually holy or catholic or whatever so he tries to get her away and 
they run into Valentina and Marius, who are also trying to flee, but... Um, They're also trying to fix their relationship at the same time. Yes. This is all happening during the trials. Valentina like, and Marius... Like, loveless. Yeah. Which they kind of were, but then the issue is is that Valentina and Marius are escaping, and they run across on, on they run across sent and Saint Angel and Luisa, and they're gonna get caught because they don't have a horse. But then Valentina and Marius have a horse, and Valentina is begging Marius to give his horse to Luisa, and he will not. And it's a very sad scene because you can see like Valentina's like regret. For everything that she did to Louisa and like her choices that ended up making Louisa be in the situation where she's begging her husband to get off the horse so that Louisa has a chance to get away because like they know she knows that they're in a more privileged dance so that they won't like even if they go to like Toledo or whatever they can't be held for anything like Louisa will be and I think it's a really it's where I really start to feel for Valentina because you realize that like she's in like a terrible loveless marriage and that she realizes that she was going about like society all wrong. So I think that's like one thing where she really like sits down and realizes that within herself. Yeah. And with because she finds like that solidarity with Louisa, like there's some small moments that they start to have where kind of like the tables are turned and like mm-hmm. Valentina is starting to like wait on Louisa and it's. You can definitely tell she's, like, developing empathy. She's doing a lot of work on herself and unlearning, even though you're not really getting the point of view to really see everything that's happening. But You can tell by her actions. Because it it ends up, like, benefiting Louisa when she goes to Toledo. Yes. She ends up getting, like, better food and whatnot because Valentina advocates for her and does everything that she possibly can from the outside. Yes. To try to rectify, like every wrong that she did to her so yes that was nice yeah um but basically like in this prison too i i'm assuming i've never been to prison but like i know that like (laughs) personally i've never been so i can't really comment on it but i do i'm not a felon i've never been to prison (laughs) that's so fucking funny (laughs) um but i do know that like they have like commissary and things like that so then like I think it does, like, I don't know if this is true about, like, 1500 Spain and stuff like that, where, like, the rich people got treated better, but I could definitely see, like, the parallels within, like, modern-day U.S. prison system, where, like, the rich people on the outside, where their families can give them money to be able to afford the nicer things in commissary and things like that. And, like, we know, like, the whole, who's that, like, chef lady that got arrested? Martha Stewart or whatever? And she had, like... Yeah, and then she had, like, a really cozy, like, prison stay and stuff like that, so. I think that's something that I guess, like, Lee Bardugo was trying to discuss, but I don't know if you can really accurately discuss that within 1500 Spain. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. But here's the thing. Then we get to, like, post-trials, and this is kind of where the story lost a lot of its ratings, mm-hmm. I think, for Chris and I. Like, where we were like, no, we're not going to rate it, like, because Luisa ends up helping um, to... Toida, um escape the prison yes. because she didn't do anything. So we find out that she actually suffers from like a, a form of dwarfism. Yes. So, so she's actually she thirty just years old. To be a child. Yeah. To not because especially I know like during those times and I know like in later times like you look at it like with like uh who's that guy the 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 greatest showman guy what's his name oh yeah 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 i I know exactly who you're talking about i can't think of his name i can't think of his his name is Is something like that no that's a different circus thing i don't know whatever the guy's name from the greatest showman he was like pt barnum that's his name um but like he would profit profit off of like people with dwarfism and stuff like that and he would lie saying that they were like old people whenever they were actually like children just very small children but he'd be like oh this is a 38 year old woman sort of thing and i think that's sort of like probably what would have happened during like 1500 spades if she was not persecuted or killed just for being like a little person anyways so that's why it makes sense but then also teoda's family is in a higher class so they're able to falsify documents and stuff like that to make it look as if he's a small child yep but then with assisting um Toyota's escape it ends up like dooming Luisa like there that was her only chance of being able to escape she can't escape mm-hmm. and then Santangel decides to 
Come to the rescue. Well, he doesn't come. Victor decides to come because he actually wants Louisa's power still. He's still so greedy. That is not helping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the dark. Louisa, uh, Victor wants Louisa and Santangel's both powers because now, because Louisa can't win this, uh, she can't win this competition, so Santangel, or Victor's like, well, I can just have you both, and Santangel, Santangel is like, no, you can't, like, Louisa's not gonna fall for this, blah, 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 and he's like, oh, she will, she'll want to live with you, blah, 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 and you're gonna tell her too, blah, 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 because I have that power over you, basically, but then Louisa basically exposes Sant Angel for being the devil, saying that he's like possessed yes. by the Antichrist and stuff like that. So then that basically dooms Sant Angel to death and Louisa to death because she's like, oh, I am a heretic and stuff like that. Which puts Victor in a very uh bad spot a because curious he- light where he can't expose anything because it'll ruin himself his and reputation unnecessary and he only has so much luck like he can yeah. only use like the luck for so much but um it end it like it sends luisa and sant on hell and also a pirate to the pyre yes and they get burned alive but not actually because luisa uses her magic to break on today's talisman and they somehow teleport somewhere else and they live happily ever after the end and Valentina becomes a lesbian and yep. then starts like a queer household with or orphans. Yeah. And there's like, orphans. she hires like an orphan chef or something. I don't know. Um, good for her. I think Valentina had a wonderful ending. She leaves her husband who goes to live on a farm or something. I don't know. In the woods. Yeah. And then, um, what a weird ending to a book though. Like, Victor I, ends up I dying very... because he is too scared to do anything. His wife leaves him. So he has a very sad ending. Sad but like deserved but then Louisa and Santa Angel gets their nice lovers ending like and they live forever literally yeah, forever and ever which I personally don't like that I think it would have been more impactful if they actually both did die on the pyre I think oh, that would have been... gotten martyred I would have cried yeah I think I because I, I, I was cheering up because I thought they were gonna die like like a few page like a few chapters before Whenever, there was too much left in the book, and I was like, fuck. Whenever Louisa this is, is like, go how I want. Louisa is, like, saying, like, her whole little spiel about how, like, she still wouldn't have changed it because she, like, loved on Angel and stuff like that, which is, like, dooming them both, and you thought, like, they're actually gonna be doomed. And the whole, like, even the beginning of the book, like, it's like, oh, if the bread wouldn't have burned, this would be a happy story, blah, blah, blah. It's a very sad and tragic story, but it's not actually. Because they end up no. getting their happy ever after. And I feel like for me, that was just really disappointing. And I know Mariah's the same way. We both very much like our characters murdered. And it's very anti Lee Bardugo. She is not above killing people. As we know in Six of Crows and King of Scars and Rule of Wolves. So but I don't know she why did. she didn't. I-, I mean, I get the idea that it's like, oh, it's a beautiful love story. But I think it would have been more beautiful and more tragic. And I think it would have had a lot more to say if they did die at the end. Like real death. That's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, so thank if you've listened this far, I'm very curious what other people thought of this book. If they mm-hmm. thought different than us, if you rated it higher or lower, lower, um, let us know. You can comment on Spotify, I believe, and also yep. in the YouTube comment section. I would like to know because I get really tired of seeing book talk reviews. So I'd actually like to know what people who listen to this podcast have to say. Yeah, about if, this. If you actually read it, if you didn't read it and why you decided not to read it too i think that would be interesting if you just decided to listen to the rundown of the podcast um yeah i think Kristen did a really good job of like summarizing I, obviously there's more that happens there's more yeah. nuance but this is like the plot points this is basically the the pacing yeah of what happened it is kind of uninteresting when you lay it out like this like okay scullion made trials it's very, then, like, stereotypical, yeah. I think. Like, it's not, like, it's not crossing any boundaries or anything, really, for, like, any novel. I think it's very, like, like cut and dry, like, book. I do think it was beautifully written. I mean, it's not my favorite Lee Bardugo. You can see. I, I am a big fan of Miss Lee. If you see my background, I have, like, everything of hers. Um, And I do, I, I did enjoy this, but I kind of was expecting more from it. I wish she would have said it underneath, like, um, like the dictator Franco's rule and, like, yeah. her characters, like, killed Franco. Like, that would have been fucking cool. <laughs> that could have been Kill cool. Kill the fascist. 
who That's cares about King of... Philip for real? Like, I don't know nothing about that guy. I mean, I don't <laughs> think Louisa does either because he's barely mentioned in this damn book. But um, other than that, thank you for watching or listening. Um, make sure you can sign up for our newsletter in the description below. Follow us on all of our social medias. And I think that is it. Bye.